cryptocurrency is really important for civil liberties in that it really takes the civil liberties benefits of cash. So the, the resistance to surveillance, the resistance to censorship, you know, the, the privacy of cash and imports it into the online world. Welcome to The Feedback Loop, a Sino-Global Capital podcast where we keep you in the loop about the most pressing issues in Web3 today. I'm your host, Mona Hamdi, a Harvard teaching fellow with 20 years of experience in nonprofit and sustainable development. I started using emerging technologies 15 years ago, working with remote peoples to create new economies based on the reversal of climate change. And today, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Sino, where I hope to bring beneficial technologies to the most forgotten corners of this planet. On today's episode, I am joined by cryptocurrency law and pi privacy and policy pioneer, Marta Belcher. Marta is the president of the Filecoin Foundation, the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, and general counsel and head of policy at Protocol Labs. She is special counsel to the EFF, the Electronic Fr Frontier Foundation, serves on a slew of boards, um, has written what she will call very fun amicus briefs for others, um, including things like the Center for Democracy and Technology, the Zcash Foundation, and uh, Blockchain Association, um, which we'll talk a little bit about for, especially for this year. She's an expert in cryptocurrency law, policy, regulation, and blockchain for the people. I'm so excited to be joined by you today, Marta. Hi. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Let's take a moment to really frame the discussion around your experience as a cryptocurrency and civil liberties attorney. Why don't you walk us through what Protocol Labs is, your affiliation with EFF around the Filecoin Foundation? Um, so Protocol Labs is a sort of open source research and development lab. You can think of it kind of like the Bell Labs of the Web3 space. And Protocol Labs has been building really this sort of fundamental infrastructure for decentralized web storage. One of the technologies they built is called IPFS, which is the interplanetary file system. And another is called Filecoin, which is a decentralized storage network. Really so delighted to get to work um, with Protocol Labs since before Filecoin's launch um, as the, you know, leading up the legal and policy teams. I also uh, serve as the president of the Filecoin Foundation, which is the governance body for the Filecoin network. So since this is an open source technology, um, it's really serving as the governance body and also an organization that's really working to build the community, build the ecosystem surrounding Filecoin and also build the decentralized web space. It's really interesting your work on decentralized web there, Marta. You were also, you had a lot to say about Senator Warren's bill. So I'm wondering, as we look, you know, we have a little bit of space and a little bit of distance now between that bill and where we find ourselves. As I hear our calls for decentralization, and I see us moving maybe in a, a way that's a little bit less decentralized than that, where are we really? Where's the nexus between decentralization and the surveillance state that you are so vigilant about? So, you know, I think one of the things that's really... Um, interesting is that we're at this moment that's kind of an inflection point because I think for decades, we've sort of just taken it as a given that financial transactions are surveilled. And for some reason, when it comes to financial transactions, we seem to have no problem with the idea that these transactions are actually turned over to the government by default without a warrant en masse. And what is really fundamentally a mass surveillance program? Um, even though the Fourth Amendment is very clear that uh, when the government wants to seek information from uh, citizens, um, it's supposed to have a warrant to do that, right? There shouldn't be this warrantless mass surveillance. Along comes cryptocurrency in the last few years. And cryptocurrency is really important for civil liberties in that it really takes the civil liberties benefits of cash. So the, the resistance to surveillance, the resistance to censorship, you know, the, the privacy of cash and imports it into the online world. Now what we're seeing in the past years and months is that lawmakers around the world, including in the United States, are increasingly taking the mass surveillance of the financial system that previously existed, and they are uh, extending it to cryptocurrency. That is very much at odds with the ethos of cryptocurrency, the whole point of cryptocurrency it, created by cypherpunks in order to protect from surveillance. And so it's this really interesting moment where we in the crypto space have an opportunity to really push back against the extension of that surveillance into cryptocurrency. But we also have an opportunity to push back against the underlying surveillance in the financial system as a whole, right? 
Um, so really interesting inflection point. And we're seeing increasingly this past year, a lot of these types of very broad surveillance regimes being applied to cryptocurrency. So two examples that are important. One is uh, what happened with Tornado Cash and the other is Senator Warren's bill. But these, I think, were examples where you can really see how this conflict between uh, the fundamentally open ethos uh, of the crypto space and the surveillance of traditional fi finance really comes to the before. I'm probably one of those people, you know, in your in your sort of cypherpunk privacy anonymity, the pseudonymity, um, human factor authentication kind of zealots where the digital right to not exist is of supreme primacy for me in terms of where we find ourselves with our digitally extended bill of rights, as it were. Are you still as optimistic about where we're going to take this legislation, looking at how we are ha actually treating the tornado cash example. No, I'm very pe pessimistic, actually. <laughs> I'm actually quite pessimistic. Well, look, so- Same, same. Yeah, because look. Be yes, you, no, feel the space because same. <laughs> well, I'm so curious what you were going to say after because. Because I'm angry about this. You know, I think that, um, are we are we actually going to retroactively and retributively punish people for writing code when there are blatant, abrogations of current existing law to mass scale where you can be let out on bail and sort of sit at home or swindle or defraud or or inflict murder and mayhem actually upon people and there's like literally an engineer who wrote some lines of code who is sort of taking upon you know their physical flesh the onus of the entire industry and of the world it seems asinine marta are we in an asinine phase of these regulations and these rules sorting themselves out is there light at the end of that tunnel i'm a little pessimistic now maybe more than i've ever been everything you just said was so well put could, definitely could not have said it better myself i i could not agree more i think fundamentally what we saw with tornado cash was how the state can in an instance change the entire space and how fundamentally open and decentralized protocols can really be targeted and how the humans who develop those protocols can end up literally in jail as a result of writing code, right? And I think yeah. um, this was really a moment that was with Tornado Cash that was really shocking to me. I think the idea of putting an entire protocol on a sanctions list is in and of itself unconstitutional. I also think that it really highlights this idea that uh, merely writing open source code can lead to such horrible consequences to have someone literally sitting in jail as a result of writing lines of code. Um, and of course, that's not the the person who was jailed. We're specifically talking about the developer um, in, the, in the Netherlands who was arrested. I think really that raises a lot of issues around the First Amendment in the United States and, and whether writing code is protected speech and to what extent people really can be prosecuted for merely writing code. I think this is actually an issue that people should care about far beyond cryptocurrency. Um, and one of the things that I've been so frustrated about in this space is when we talk about financial surveillance and when we talk about things like tornado cash, I think outside of the cryptocurrency space, a lot of people, even developers, even people who really deeply care about you know, uh, civil liberties are, are sort of like, well, that's different, that's money. And I just completely disagree. I think if you are a developer in any, whether it's cryptocurrency or anything else, I think you should be really concerned about someone being arrested for merely writing open source code. That's really interesting to me because it touches on some of the, to, to bring back, you know, sort of your December statements on Senator Warren's bill. Um, I'm wondering about those speech and privacy protections and sort of your personal identity protections when we're talking about some of those bills, really strenuous requirements on KYC, on personal information, on report filing, on the privacy protections ostensibly that blockchain might afford us, but also might expose us to. Where is the reconciliation or where is the way to move forward? Do you think that privacy and anonymity are viable um, if we were to continue in this path? Yeah. So, you know, first of all, um, I think it's worth talking a little bit about uh, Senator Warren's recently introduced bill, um, because I think it really represents um, something that is just completely untenable and targets cryptocurrency in a way that is frankly unprecedented and also 
targets privacy and anonymity technologies in a way that is unprecedented. Um, so two separate, very important things that I think people should care about, regardless of whether they care about cryptocurrency. From the crypto perspective, what it what the bill actually would do is it would require almost all participants in blockchain networks to register as money service businesses. Um, and so this includes miners, wallet creators, software developers, um, just really shockingly broad group of people who would suddenly be quote money services businesses. Anyone who's in that category um, would then need to register with the government. They would need to be developing and maintaining very complicated anti-money laundering programs. They would be collecting the personal information of every person who uses their software and filing reports with the government about users' transactions. Fundamentally, when you think of that, these network participants literally cannot do that. That's the whole point, right? It's it's pseudonymous. Um, and so it really would grind the entire blockchain ecosystem to a halt. So it is just completely untenable and really effectively bans cryptocurrency in the United States. That is the actual effect that the bill would have. The bill also effectively bans privacy enhancing technologies in yes. blockchain networks. So it prohibits all financial institutions, um, which includes everyone I just mentioned, Inclu includes all of those um, miners, validators, independent network participants, it bans them from using or transacting with um, digital asset mi mixers, um, privacy coins, and any other anonymity enhancing technology. This is really shocking. And I think if you're someone who cares about things like Tor and the ability to move through the world in a way that is private, to have a bill that is effectively banning these types of privacy technologies in the United States is really concerning, um, again, regardless of whether you care about cryptocurrency. So we have yet to see Senator Warren re reintroduce the bill, but I really hope that when she does reintroduce it this session, that civil liberties advocates will really take it as a moment to push back against what is a really unprecedented attack on privacy technologies. I think it's it's timely. I think that the the issue of MSBs, it's very interesting because even within our industry, I think that it's something that I hear the lawyers among us talk a lot about. And, and I know definitely that the miners feel it almost in a sense of being like canaries in the coal mine. But I think for the average everyday user or citizen, the ideas that the idea that you might have this enforcement put upon you and then maybe be enforced retroactively is scary to me. It sort of violates, it sort of brings up this idea that I have about maybe always walking the liminal edge of being the Jason Bo in the Jason Bourne scenario, that you'll walk along trying to live your life in this compliant manner and then somehow still be contrary to the whims or of the state or worse. And I'm wondering that that bill or any sort of reintroduction of that bill comes when we have a Biden infrastructure bill and when we have a new subcommittee on digital assets. What is this bill going to land in and what's our way forward? I mean, I think you can't really talk about the political climate of crypto right now in America without talking about FTX, unfortunately, because fundamentally, you know, this bill, Senator Warren's bill was actually introduced during the Senate hearing about FTX right in the wake of um, what happened. Um, and I think unfortunately, the like what has happened with FTX has really cast a pall over the rest of the industry. I think completely unfairly, because my view is first of all, this was just run of the mill fraud. And I think it doesn't matter what technology you use to commit fraud. It doesn't matter if you use cryptocurrency or email or pen and paper, the technology is irrelevant. You committed fraud. And this exact fraud could have been committed using literally any technology. It just happens to have been cryptocurrency. But this this same this 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 also could have happened um, with fiat. And then I think second of all, you know, when you really think about what's going on with FTX, FTX is a central intermediary. This is exactly the thing that the crypto space and the cryptocurrency technology is intended to avoid, which is having to trust massive amounts of your money or any of your money with a third party, which is exactly what FTX was. So if anything, it actually shows the importance of decentralized technologies, not not the opposite, right? Um, and so I really do think it's unfair that that everything that is happening right now in the political climate in the US uh, with regards to cryptocurrencies is sort of against the backdrop of FTX. I do think it's really unfair for the cryptocurrency space. And I also think, unfortunately, that's kind of what we're walking into this congressional session. It's going to be a really uh, impactful year. Um, and I think we're going to be playing a lot of defense. Because the counter argument is that some of these very stringent policies, and again, coming back to the idea of MSBs and stringent 
KYC, really keeping that domiciled in the US is in fact in response to, and these bills are being presented in light of the FTX situation with the idea that overwhelming rhetoric here in Washington DC is, well, if we kept it here, if we kept it in house, it wouldn't have happened. Is there an actual viable way forward with some of these bills and some of these policies that are being introduced now in 2023, or do we need to completely overhaul and rethink this? This is sort of an age old question, right? Is how do you balance the civil liberties of citizens and the needs of law enforcement? This is like not a new question. Lucky for us, the fourth amendment actually has a really clear answer to that. So the way that you balance the needs of law enforcement with the rights of citizens is that when there is probable cause, law enforcement can go to a judge and get a warrant and then can engage in collecting information in, in, in searches and seizures. And so under the Fourth Amendment, information about people's private lives is not supposed to be turned over to the government by default. What is supposed to happen is the government and law enforcement officials are supposed to go get a warrant in order to have these personal details about someone's life. This is very clear in the Fourth Amendment, right? This is actually a pretty easy answer in terms of how should we be balancing these these two things. Unfortunately, we have strayed pretty far from that. And the reason that we have strayed pretty far from that is this thing called the third party doctrine. Yes. So the idea behind the third party doctrine is that once you have given your information to a third party, you've lost your reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. So for example, in the context of financial transactions, there was a case in the 1970s um, called uh, U.S. v. Miller, where that was basically about what, what was then uh, the sort of early version of the Bank Secrecy Act, whether that was unconstitutional. And the idea was, well, since th what the Supreme Court held at the time in the 1970s was, well, since you gave your information to a bank, that bank can go ahead and turn that over to the government without a warrant. Um, and the, the, the government can ask the bank to turn that information over to them without a warrant um, because you've lost your reasonable expectation of privacy by giving it to that third party. But what has happened is, as we've entered this digital world, so much of our daily lives, in fact, almost all of our daily lives is actually lived through third parties, right? When you're on Zoom, that's a third party. When you're using Gmail, that's a third party. When you're using your cell phone, that's a third party. Like, And so as it turns out, our entire lives right now are lived through th third parties. And all of this information about us, we have now lost our reasonable expectation of privacy in and is can be turned over and is turned over to the government by default in many cases, particularly when it comes to financial transactions. For me, um, you know, it is so important for us to really start looking at that, talking about how we can challenge it. And in recent years, the Supreme Court has actually started to chip away at the third party doctrine because it has really realized that the amount of information you could glean from someone's transactions going through a third party was so small in the 1970s compared to now. Um, and so we've had a string of cases that are really chipping away at the third party doctrine, but not yet in the context of something like the Bank Secrecy Act, which is the act under which a lot of this financial information is turned over. I believe that the surveillance that happens right now is unconstitutional. And I think there's a pretty good chance that the Supreme Court might agree. I do have a little bit of optimism that maybe, maybe there will be some way that maybe even in the cryptocurrency context, there will be a way to challenge the, sur the mass surveillance that we're seeing today. You know, that brings an interesting point. And I'm wondering how sort of tax code or some of that enforcement maybe plays into that. I know that there's certain changes to like section 6050I of the tax code that probably has some weight on, on this. How do these changes affect some of those cryptocurrency transactions or affect some of our failure to comply? Like what are the punitive measures that maybe are not being addressed by law, but maybe that we're looking at with code? So look, under the tax code, as part of the infrastructure bill that got pushed through as sort of a must pass bill, there were several provisions that related to cryptocurrency that got pushed through with no amendments. That's its own, pro that's its like, omnibus bills or its own, their own. I was just going to say the fact that it's section 6050I. So what 6050I does is it requires the businesses that receive $10,000 in cash to collect the identity details of people who are paying in cash and then report that transaction to the government by default. Importantly, failure to comply is actually a felony, which is punishable by up to five years in prison. Um, and so what the infrastructure bill did is it extended 6050I to include anyone who in the course of doing business receives over $10,000 in digital assets, right? 
So that is huge. The idea that anytime that over 10,000 digital assets is exchanged, um, that there has to be a report with the government is to me just extremely concerning. There are challenges to this um, on constitutional grounds. Mm -hmm. And I really do believe that that this kind of thing is is unconstitutional. Crossing my fingers on those challenges, though, um, these types of things take a really long time and, uh, you know, may, may or may not go the distance. But Meanwhile, here we are with 6050I enacted as law. Can you tell me a little bit more about this? There are a ton of different ways in which financial surveillance happens today, not in the non-cryptocurrency context, which includes things like the Bank Secrecy Act, where massive amounts of information get turned over from financial institutions to the government about our day-to-day -day financial transactions, which I see as warrantless mass surveillance in the financial context. And really what we're seeing is in a variety of different ways, that kind of surveillance being extended to cryptocurrency, um, including, for example, what we're seeing in the infrastructure uh, bill um, that that was passed, um, including six, Section 6050I, and also including um, things like Senator Warren's bill, which goes far beyond even just surveillance and really frankly, outright banning and <laughs> like, like effectively outright banning the technologies. I think these are really important for us in the cryptocurrency space to push back on. You know, we're seeing lawsuits against the government for these types of things. And as you well know, lawsuits take a very long time and off are very expensive and often don't sort of go the distance. So who knows whether those will end up actually having the effect we want them to have. And in the meantime, these things just end up being the law and definitely something that I think is only going to get worse this year, just as we go into a session of Congress post FTX and really deal with all the fallout from, from that. So Marta at Davos, I, I caught your panel where you were, you know, sitting with an American lawmaker and a Ukrainian government official. And I'm so mindful these days of, uh, we are now in the wake of, of the 7.8 in magnitude earthquake that just has devastated Turkey and Syria. And one of the things that I've noticed is I see the no-fly zone around a people who have, you know, been in 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 the throes of a civil war for the better part of the last decade. Who, as I meet these people in my part of the world, when we talk about global adoption and we talk about um, decentralized governance around these new technologies, it's never lost on me, Marta, that most of the young people that I meet in refugee camps and from war zones and displaced peoples would not be able to pass those very same governance mechanisms, those KYC thresholds that we've imposed upon ourselves and the world to their detriment. And I'm wondering, you know, it doesn't sit right with me that I can't figure out which is worse and which is more punitive as we widen that chasm between people who have access to basic infrastructures in these sort of post-conflict and, and post-disaster situations and the ones that we are creating with our technology and with the rules around them. I don't know. Do you have any guidance for me? I'm finding it. I don't know what to say about that other than, uh, we, how do we, how do we close this gap between the haves and the have nots in terms of who gets KYC is a very delicate political and now very fraught issue. It is such a tough issue because when you talk about sanctions, as you said, I think the intention of the government is to really target bad actors, to target the authorities um, in, in these sort of parts of the world and the people who actually get cut off from the rest of the world as a result are in large part completely innocent people who are frankly the victims of the atrocities of the people who are being sanctioned, right? And so I don't think that the government intended or intends, I don't think if you talk to someone at OFAC that they're trying to cut off the yeah. victims of these atrocities from right. the from financial institutions from technologies right i mean you're talking about a lot of technologies are geofenced you know around right like you literally can't use a lot of these technologies um in in certain parts of the world but that's the effect um and i think it's something that's really worth reflecting on i think this is another example of where crypto really gives us this moment to as we see these tech, as we see these onerous laws and regulations being extended to cryptocurrency, it gives us a moment to reflect and say, do these laws and regulations make sense in the first place? Um, and what are the effects of these laws and regulations? And so I think it is a moment for us 
to reflect on that. I think it's also a really good moment for us to think about the ways in which decentralized technologies can really enable access to knowledge and technology for people who otherwise wouldn't have it. Just to give you one example, in Turkey, Wikipedia was blocked and there were people who used IPFS to actually be able to access Wikipedia in Turkey um, during that time. Um, so just one example of how these types of technologies can really enable the type of censorship resistance that really puts power and information back into the hands of the people who have been so affected by these types of atrocities and these types of uh, regimes. Maybe in a way, maybe when I look at the bills that we're proposing and we sort of put these onerous encumbrances upon people, I'm wondering how exactly our reporting mechanisms or that sort of procedural stuff might be creating these subsets of people who are digitally distanced from one another just because they wouldn't be able to meet those basic thresholds of reporting or accountability. And at what point those things, instead of becoming shields, become swords? You're, you're completely right. And I think that, you know, like many laws, it's like the intention may have been one thing. But right. the implementation is a completely other thing. And the effect of sanctions law, even if the government didn't intend for sanctions right. laws, and and look, reasonable minds can differ on whether they intended it, but even right. if they, they only intend it to, to really be going after bad actors, the effect is right. that um in the that entire populations, including the victims of atrocities, are actually the ones who are affected. And that's what we're saying. We're talking about that in these populations that we're seeing post sort of conflict and post disaster. And we're talking about that in the crypto industry too, where it's like, there was this one bad actor and now hundreds of thousands of us are sort of, you know, am I an MSB? Like, are you my mommy? Like what's the future? For <laughs> <laughs> First of all, let's start right at the top with the Star Trek stuff. What is IPFS? <laughs> yeah, this is this is a thing that I am very optimistic about. So one of the things that we, we announced uh, in Davos is that uh, the Filecoin Foundation is working with Lockheed Martin um, to bring IPFS to space. And um, this is really exciting news. And, and the reason is, um, so what IPFS is, it actually stands for the Interplanetary File System. Um, and IPFS actually, right. And, and the reason it's called the Interplanetary File System is because from the beginning, it was actually envisioned as a technology um, that could really enable networking across long distances uh, in a way that isn't possible with today's centralized internet model. The reason for that is that today's centralized internet model uh, really relies on looking for information at a particular server in a particular location. So when you're looking for a piece of information using today's centralized internet, you are literally looking for it on a particular server in a particular place, and you're sort of hoping it's still there. Um, and what happens is if you're in space, there's a really long delay um, if you have to go back and forth from a server on Earth every single time you're trying to request information. If you're on the moon, there's a multi-second delay from Earth. And if you're on Mars, there's a multi-minute delay on Earth. So every time you need to retrieve information, you're going to have to go a, a, a wait a really long time. Mm -hmm. And what IPFS does is instead of retrieving content by where it is, so instead of retrieving it from a particular server in a particular place, IPFS lets you, it sort of enables you to uh, get content based on what it is. So each piece of content has a unique content ID and you actually uh, look for that particular content ID and it will actually pull that content from wherever's closest. So if you already downloaded it once, it's going to be on your hardware. If there's a moon lunar station nearby that has it, it's going to pull it from there. If there's a passing satellite that has it, it's going to pull it from there. So um, it actually eliminates wow. a lot of the delay because it enables you to pull information from wherever's closest instead of having to pull it back and forth from Earth every single time. So um, this is why the technology was actually developed in the first place in, in many ways. It was it was sort of envisioned as a technology that could enable networking in space. The demonstration mission is going to be um, likely in the second half of this year. We're going to be using, uh, during Davos, we, we announced the sort of specific details of what we're doing. Um, we're going to be using the LM400 spacecraft. IPFS content is going to be pulled from sensors on that spacecraft, and then is going to be transmitted down to Earth using the IPFS protocol and, and uh, using content IDs. And then anyone down on Earth um, is going to be able to get that data from the sensors using IPFS. So it's really going to demonstrate how IPFS can work in space um, mm -hmm. and, and also uh, back and forth from Earth. So we're really excited about it um, and really excited to do that demonstration mission this year. Anywhere. Anyone anywhere will be able to access the data that is being pulled from the LM400 spacecraft um, using IPFS. 
Uh, and not only that, not only will they be able to access it, but importantly, they're going to be able to actually cryptographically verify that that data hasn't been tampered with. You know, when you think about all the different types of data you might get from space, whether that's communications, whether that's files, whether that's temperature data, whether that's climate data, or whether that's photographs, right? Um, all of these different things, um, to be able to cryptographically verify that they have not been tampered with is, is, is really something in addition to the other benefits that we've talked about of IPFS. So I'm um, definitely really excited about um, that demonstration mission this year. What else are you excited about? I know I'm ending our time here with you, Marta, and I just wanted to, you know, I'm glad that we end on an up note. Um, and that there's something that's really keeping you excited. When when Marta's happy, everybody's happy, as it were. <laughs> um, well, well, thank you, thank you for saying that. Um, you know, another thing I'm really excited about is um, we are actually putting government data onto the Filecoin network to preserve it. We're do we're, there's all sorts of really cool data that is already on the Filecoin network, which includes evidence of war crimes in Ukraine, again, cryptographically verified. It includes things like human rights data. Um, but one thing I'm, I'm personally very excited about as someone who really cares about policy in addition to uh, decentralized technologies is we announced with the Internet Archive that we are working with them on um, actually preserving and collecting uh, government data sets around the world in a project called Democracies Library. So that's another recent announcement that I'm really excited about. I'm so excited that we're going to be able to preserve government data from around the world on the Filecoin network. Um, and that's another that's another really exciting thing we have coming up. That sounds amazing. Tell me a little bit more about that. What is the average citizen in, I'm from Egypt. Let's talk about somebody from Egypt or Burkina Faso. What does this mean for the most remote places and the most remote governments around the world? In fact, you don't even actually have to go far to really understand why this is important. So during the Obama administration, there were massive amounts of information um, and data that was collected by the EPA and was put online um, and, and made available to the public. And during the Trump administration, it all got deleted. It all got removed from the web and was no longer available. So all of this really precious and important data about the environment is no longer available to citizens, right? And so this is this is something that happens in the United States. It's also something that happens outside of the United States. You see it all the time. Um, you have these important government data sets and there are all sorts of reasons that someone would want government data sets, whether it be climate data sets or other, you know, um, other reasons, um, all sorts of reasons that this type of important data gets uh, removed by the next administration. Just from a perspective of really preserving information for citizens, um, for them to be able to make informed decisions, for them to be able to continue to access data regardless of what the administration is, um, we think it's such an important mission. Um, and we're just so thrilled to get to work with the Internet Archive and support their Democracies Library project. I'm a big Superman fan. And I don't know if you're into this or if anyone at Filecoin Foundation thinks of this, but when I first heard about us doing, uh, or about you doing this, us, I'm in this, I, I have skin in the game. It reminded me of the Fortress of Solitude. So like Superman goes to this place where he has all of the wisdom of all of the records of Krypton to help him figure out what to do. And mm -hmm. I am a very big fan of these sorts of archiving and digitizing projects. And I'm a, a, just a great admirer, admirer of your work. Thank you so much. I, I love that metaphor. No one has ever used that metaphor with me before. And I am going to absolutely steal that going forward. Get right on that fortress of solitude. You guys got to go see, you got to check out Krypton. I think that that's how, that's how Superman ends up saving all of planet earth. So, so there's something to that. There is something to, you know, those better democratic ideals of keeping a record. I think that it's very important to remember that those aren't, things are not universal that they are precious and fragile and that they definitely are some of the things that are challenged when we sit at the digital forefront of the rest of our history. So um, I find that I find that fascinating. I will be watching space. I will be watching Filecoin Foundation for the IPFS. Um, and I will be watching you, Marta Belcher. So thanks for thanks for being out there. Thank you so much. It's honestly such a pleasure to get to have this conversation with you. And I'm looking forward to hopefully more conversations in the future. Our time is up for now, but the conversation is still going. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Sino Global Cap, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and leave us your feedback so we can loop it into upcoming episodes.